The chilling stories and visionary writing of author H.P. Lovecraft make up an indelible part of our modern understanding of horror. Next to Stephen King and Edgar Allan Poe, Lovecraft's is probably the most recognizable and evocative name in the entire genre. But the author's work has proved exceedingly difficult to adapt for a visual medium. In spite of some admirable efforts, we've never really seen a definitive cinematic interpretation of the Lovecraftian style, a challenge which continues to entice a number of prominent horror filmmakers. Probably the most exciting ongoing attempt has been the 30-year odyssey of Mexican director Guillermo del Toro to film At the Mountains of Madness, one of Lovecraft's longest, biggest, and scariest stories. It's an endeavor that stretches from his earliest days as a young fantasy and horror prodigy emerging out of Mexico all the way up to his current status as a celebrated and Oscar-winning Hollywood veteran, and it still seems to be far from concluding. This is the, so far, unresolved history of Guillermo del Toro's At the Mountains of Madness. Lovecraft's style was not like anything the horror genre had seen before. It was a new form, an obsessive, archaic, and eccentric brand of horror that was entirely his own. In Lovecraft's time, it was often referred to as weird fiction, a term closely related to the pulp magazine Weird Tales, in which almost all of the author's stories were originally published. Today, people sometimes define it as cosmic horror, emphasizing Lovecraft's focus on cosmic indifference and human insignificance. Perhaps the only appropriate term is simply Lovecraftian. His stories were a curious mixture of scientific rigor, esoteric fantasy, and pulp thrills. His biggest scares were not often visceral or immediate. They were subtle, existential, produced by his powerful ability to suggest the immense, the inhuman, and the uncanny. At the Mountains of Madness is one of the author's perfectly emblematic pieces. It contains almost every mark of his genius, every quirk of his imagination, and every compulsive layer of detail that lent such intensity to his writing. This short novel, written in 1931, centers on a fictional research expedition to remote and uncharted regions of Antarctica. After being cut short by tragedy, one of the survivors, our narrator, is forced to make public the expedition's terrifying and secret discoveries in an urgent effort to halt a forthcoming return voyage. His account describes the accidental discovery of a cyclopean mountain range and beyond an ancient city, eons older than all previously recorded forms of life on Earth. Part of the expedition turns up dead after uncovering the preserved remains of monstrous creatures, believed to be an extraterrestrial race called the Elder Things. Against his better judgment, our narrator ventures on with the other survivors into the abandoned city, and begins to piece together its inconceivably remote history. Built millions of years ago by the Elder Things, who ruled over the planet in the primordial past, the city and its inhabitants were eventually wiped out by formless beings called Shogoths. It was the Elder Things themselves who brought the Shogoths into being through scientific experiments. As an unintended side effect of their creation, the Elder Things also gave birth to all other life on the planet, including the human race. Horrified at their discoveries, the remaining scientists flee the city after realizing it is not as deserted as they originally thought. They barely escape with their lives, and as the terrible mountain range retreats into the distance, they are hit with an unbearable realization. What they saw was not even the worst of the region's dark secrets. Beyond the city, there lies another mountain range, harboring an even greater evil, something so awful it can't even be described, let alone comprehended, by the feeble human mind. The story, and especially the ending, is one of Lovecraft's most impressive achievements. It encompasses all of his pessimism, misanthropy, and his firm, final belief in the cold and vast indifference of the universe. First-time readers might be taken aback by the languorous narrative and Lovecraft's meticulous attention to scientific accuracy. He spends a somewhat excessive amount of time describing things in minute and elaborate detail. Everything from the mind-boggling geometry of the alien city to the inner and outer physiology of the Elder Things, 
right down to the precise geography of the Antarctic setting, and even the specific functions of the expedition's technical equipment. It's not essential for narrative purposes, but it's actually an important part of how Lovecraft builds his atmosphere. Although he's known for his mystical plot lines and nebulous monsters, the author went to extreme lengths to create a feeling of realism in his stories. It was his way of lowering the reader's logical defenses, setting them up for the more extravagant and shadowy ideas he would reach later in the stories. Important, too, is the shared universe he created for much of his fiction, which we now refer to as the Cthulhu Mythos. At the Mountains of Madness contains many casual references to Lovecraft staples, like the Necronomicon, Miskatonic University, and the anti-deity Cthulhu himself. It all has the unsettling effect of making Lovecraft's fantastic creations seem eerily convincing, as if he were somehow describing real places and real things. He worked hard to achieve these effects, assembling his style from the latest scientific theories and lessons gleaned from the work of his favorite authors. Lovecraft was a copious reader, with an intimate knowledge of literary technique. His own output was small, but he labored to give each story a carefully distilled, frightening potency. His work was considered puzzling and difficult to market. His reclusive habits and nervous temperament did little to help his career. For the entire duration of his professional life, the author went completely unrecognized and remained almost totally unknown. His personal life was plagued by financial troubles, family issues, mental illness, and fragile health. He died young at the age of 46 in 1937. At the time of his death, he could only consider himself an abject failure. It was only in the decades that followed his passing that Lovecraft slowly rose from obscurity to become a cult hero. Readers who discovered his unforgettable stories inevitably shared them with friends. Horror fans celebrated their originality and their masterful evocation of oppressive existential dread. By the latter half of the 20th century, his work was finally earning recognition as some of the strangest and most imaginative writing of its era. Countless imitators and spiritual successors began taking inspiration from his stories. Lovecraft's creative legacy started rapidly expanding. Writers, filmmakers, musicians, comic book artists, and video game designers all endeavored to borrow or interpret or even recreate his style. What became apparent during that time was that his work was extremely easy to lift certain ideas from but it was almost impossible to recreate in its full scope. The efforts to adapt Lovecraftian horror to the screen resulted in many interesting interpretations, but no one has yet figured out how to translate the author's entire genius into cinematic terms, and it's entirely possible no one ever will. 